All right. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. On behalf of Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center, I'd like to welcome you all to Emergent Grammars, a reading featuring our phenomenal, four phenomenal writers, Trao Trang, Maider Vang, Kathy Lin Che, and Kathy Shang. My name is Jimmy Vega, and I'm the operations manager and workshop coordinator of Beyond Baroque. Um, and before we get started, I'd, I'd like to um, start by acknowledging Beyond Baroque's presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism, genocidal practices, and the violent disposition of their land. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Beyond Baroque is Los Angeles's oldest literary institution located in Venice, California. Founded in 1968, we support writers and help cultivate new writing through our extensive program of writing workshops, readings, and performances. We're currently offering a number of workshops online via Zoom. Upcoming workshops include our free weekly Monday night fiction workshop facilitated by Raquel Baker and our historic Wednesday night poetry workshop currently facilitated by Joseph Rios. We also have a number of intensive paid workshops, including an upcoming workshop this Saturday, November 20th, titled Fundamentals of Fiction Writing with Laurie Horowitz, which will focus on the formation of a writer's toolbox. And in December, we have a very exciting science fiction workshop with Rika Aoki happening Saturday, December 4th. More information of all of our workshops can be found at www.beyondbaroque.org. These links will also be shared in the chat momentarily and throughout the event. While Beyond Baroque remains closed to the public, we do have a current online art exhibition titled Found Made, which is being featured throughout November and includes works by various um, artists, including our very own web designer, Jody Zellin, which remember places, people, experiences, and even political events, preserving and transforming these monuments into works of art. More information on our current online exhibit can similarly be found on our website and in the chat. Apart from our programs and workshops, we also offer memberships to Beyond Baroque for as little as $30 for students or seniors. Purchasing a membership is an enormous help to us during the pandemic and helps us continue to offer free online programming, as well as our weekly free community writing workshops. As many of you know, our memberships also provide a discount on our, on our intensive workshops as well. Um, before I introduce the first writer, of the evening, I'd like to give a special thanks to Nilanjana Banjari, managing editor of Kaya Press, along with a warm thank you to Mary Long, who is the publicity associate of Kaya Press for all their help and support in the coordination of this special reading. A big thank you to Beyond Baroque's executive director, Quentin Ring, along with all of our staff. Uh, another big thank you to Ivan Salinas, our programs and communications fellow, and to Angeline Keck, our programs and publications intern, for all of their work behind the scenes. And finally, thank you to all who are present in shared virtual space. Thank you for your continued support to the literary arts tonight and beyond. Um, after our reading today, we will have a short Q&A um, following uh, our last um, reader. So feel free to drop questions, comments in the chat and we can definitely field them out throughout the event. Um, our first reader for tonight is Kathy Shang. Kathy is a Hmong American poet from Fresno, California. She's the author of the full length poetry collection, Poor Anima, Apogee Press 2015, and three chapbooks, Ode to the Far Shore, Platypus Press 2016, Dear Hour, New Michigan Press 2014, and Elegies, University of Montana 2013. She received her Master of Fine Arts from the University of Montana and a Bachelor of Arts from Ohio Northern University. Her work has been featured in Poetry, Gulf Coast, The Ordrant Journal, Academy of American Poets, Poetry, Society of America, The New York Times, and elsewhere. In 2018, her poem on visiting the Franklin Park Conservatory on Botanical Gardens was highlighted in an immersive poetry installation at the Poetry Foundation Gallery in Chicago a collaboration between the Poetry Foundation and the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, centering on the conversation of grief and loss. In the following year, she was awarded 2019 Best of the Net for her poem, Year of the Cardinal Song 7. Chong's honors include a 2020 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation and the 
Nadia Eisenberg Fellowship from McDowell, a Vermont Studio Center Fellowship, and an Individual uh, Excellence Award from the Ohio Arts Council. So to kick us off this evening, uh, Kathy, please take us away. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. It's an honor and a privilege to be here reading alongside the folks you'll be hearing tonight, especially in celebration of Trong Tran's newest collection, Book of the Other, small in comparison. I want to thank Kaya Press and Beyond Baruch for hosting and to those here with us today. Tonight, I'll be reading three poems, but one that honors my late brother, uh, one that honors my friend and her grief, and one that honors my late mother. This first poem is called Year of the Cardinal Song Three. And it's part of a series that I haven't returned to since 2014, which was when I started to deeply write about my grief over my brother's death. I also haven't read it very much, so I wanted to honor the peace and the memories surrounding the first few days and year uh, of what, what has evolved to become complicated grief. Year of the Cardinal Song, three. Not since the last year of the Cardinal Song did it bloom. A kind goodbye and a game of flowers, a switch in the air as we absolved the days from further entry into the house. It could have fooled me and I wanted to be after learning the bulb had begun softening in the dirt the way we have handled stories in the past, the way we could have only behaved, or so I am told. Like you, I left it in the pot. Minu, happy is eating, but you are no longer eating. To lose the halves of you, I am the worst of keepers. Fleeting, as the rain trellising the red notes of the cardinal. Whatever malady is left to rob me, I will be your bloom. Do not help me, and how could you? We are wiser when we can no longer measure darkness inside our bodies, and we lure ourselves onto the flower bed because this is what we do in the world of the living the nights to bend our hearts until we own that space as we shake from hands that touch us in our sleep. So wild and full of sorry, please. This second poem is called Asta So, and it's for and after my friend Asta So. The poem is very dear to me as well, as it holds space for my friend and their grief and um, for, for their family member. It's been a journey for the two of us, exploring what grief looks like and its possession on us. And it's also been a while since I've revisited the poem and just wanted to give light and to think of them and to let them know I'm, I'm always thinking. Asta so. As is the case for the canonical tear in the brain's best images, the body learns to protect itself from the overflowing lakes in the alleys of the eyes. From the growing dread the size of a child, from mother's voice returning like the cut of a tree, mute and parallel to the tall grass collapsing whichever way the wind commands. Do we err when we blink and do we move when it is over? Or does the body stay to mend in place? In the garden of severe punishment, we occupy the chance that a face is retrievable and that names can be saved 
so long as we remember to plant and pray in the direction of our loved ones. Or so one can believe in this valley of burden. But the amber hills are purposefully bright, marked with mobs of forgiving mule deer migrating back to the lands of their ancestors. Then there's the sun in this crowning scene where shadows eternally lay by their bodies, anchored to their forms as an act of loyalty. Hard to admire a law that forbids autonomy as well as familiarity of one's muscle perpetually fading into the repeating lessons of love at first sight. Hospitable for the moment and sweet every time. Not a single hair to tell apart departure from meeting that food can grow here in this plot of blurred season and the finest silk has already spun in three lifetimes. And this final poem I'll be sharing tonight is the newest piece I've been working on. It honors my late mother and it and my ongoing relationship to her death. Thank you all again for being here and for joining us. I'm really excited and cannot wait to hear the others tonight. Columbarium for Past Autumns. For a time, the home was lost to me. My mouth forged in the night as I dreamed away the barriers. Stars lengthening the line of my gaze. Barrel bones rushed to storm. To my eternal right, clouds in immediate rotation. Mother mutating past clay and desire. Too light to form. Too dead to surrender like meat made tender by memory, effortless. My head at the helm towards pardon, my hands passing through water, her eye on the wretched edge seating air with every intention of life. Such mischief, even from the wilds of death, from the alcoves of full of metal and shadowy glass, dust heavy on my crown. What I pretend to gather here still dies past the trees, absent from birth, the promise to lay by dusk, to set ablaze the home. Veritable fire coming west for the lonely shores. In the periphery, I have not returned before, have stayed lost, just to retain the impossibility of ends, a march to bury what remains. And no, I don't fall in. I just lean weakly into the weeds. Thank you. Wow, thank you for that. That was beautiful. Thank you, Kathy. Um, up next, we have Kathy Lin Che, who is the author of Split, Alice James Books, winner of the Kundaman Poetry Prize, the Norma Farber First Book Award from the Poetry Society of America, and the Best Poetry Book Award from the Association of Asian American Studies. Her work has been published in The New Republic, The Nation, McSweeney's, and Poetry Magazine. She has received awards from McDowell, Sewanee Writers, Conference, Jurarsi, Walipia Bay Air, the Anderson Center, the Kimmel Harton Nelson Center, Artist Trust, Hedgebrook, Poets House, Poets and Writers, the Fine Arts Work Center at Provincetown, the Asian American Literary Review, the Center for Book Arts, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council's Workspace Residency, the Jerome Foundation. She has taught at the 92nd Street Y, New York University, Fordham University, Sierra Nevada College, and the Polytechnic University at NYU. 
She was Sierra Nevada College's Distinguished Visiting Professor and Writer in Residence. She is working on a poetry manuscript, a creative nonfiction manuscript, and a short documentary with director Christopher Radcliffe on her parents' experiences and as refugees who played extras on Apocalypse Now. She's currently a PhD student in English at Fordham University. She serves as executive director at Kundiman and lives on the traditional lands of the Lenape people. Please welcome Kathy Lynche. Hi, everybody. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here, and I'm so grateful for um, Muriel and uh, Neela and the wonderful crew at Kaya Press for the invitation, for the wonderful staff at Beyond Baroque, especially um, Yvonne, Jimmy, and Quinton, and to my fellow readers, uh, especially to Trung Tran, um, who was one of the first Vietnamese American poets I'd ever heard read live when I was a very emerging writer myself. Um, also grateful to be in company with Maider and Kathy, who's reading was just so heart stopping and really grateful to be here with you all. And thank you all so much for coming out. As um, thank, thank you, Jimmy, for that bio. Um, I'm reading an excerpt from um, some of these pieces, my memoir and a poetry manuscript. And I'll show a little bit from a mood board for the film that my friend and I hope to make one day. Um, so, you know, it is about my parents' lives and more specifically around that experience of my parents who are refugees from the Vietnam War, who when they were living in the Philippines, they were hired to play extras in Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now. This happened, you know, they left in 1975 and um, they were in the refugee camp for 11 months. And, you know, about month nine was when they um, for two months worked as extras. And though this happened 45 years ago, I hope to add their stories to this important history and iconography and to talk about the complexities of telling and retelling family stories. And I dedicate this reading to my family and to my kin. Um, thank you all for coming. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the dearlings in the chat um, for um, saying, for the exclamation points and hearts. That means a lot to me. Okay, so I'm going to try to do a little screen sharing. If it doesn't work, then um, we'll just have to do without, and that's fine. So I'm going to try to just give you a little background. Let's see if it works. Okay, so um, here's my mother and here's my father. Um, and so in, in the past couple of years, I've been interviewing my parents as we watch the film Apocalypse Now to kind of gather up where they are located in the film. So, um, you know, I'm just going to take you through a few film stills with um, some of their voices and some of, you know, uh, my, my translation into English. So the first one says, um, daughter, was the film like the war? Father, the film was like the war, just like it. Father, I was in one of those helicopters. I was playing an interpreter. Father, there, there, I was driving that car. Look, it's exploding. It was a Citrion. It was very light. During the filming, Godam was three months pregnant, but nobody knew because her belly was still small. Father, I think it was 80 pesos. Each day we earned 12 or $13 each person. Father, that group next to the lake, that's all of us from the refugee camp. We're handcuffed, playing POWs, captured by the Vikam. Your mom and dad were in that group. So that final photo you see uh, in the foreground, a very shirtless Robert Duvall and you know some soldiers also in the foreground. And you can hardly see by the lake, there are small figures kind of to around where his thighs are. 
um, in a different photo, it, you know, he's kneeling, so it's around where his chest is. And so my parents, you know, when we're watching the film, I'm tr always trying to look for them and that's where I could find them um, in these kind of small um, areas of the film. And so that's part of the poetry project that I'm thinking about, um, as well as a memoir and as well as the um, film. So I'm going to um, do a little screen sharing of the actual, let me see if I could find it, of just some poems just for accessibility and also to minimize my face so that um, the words take up more space. So let's try to see if this works. That's my intro. Okay, so this is an excerpt from of some prose first. Fade in. My parents, along with 100 other refugees, were cast as extras in Apocalypse Now. The red late cross ladies wore red, head to toe. They asked my parents if they wanted to be in a movie. They said yes. Everyone in the refugee camp said yes. On the set, the film crew dressed my mother in black pajamas. They issued her a machine gun. They gave her a Viet Cong hat and placed her under a thatched roof. She shot up into the American helicopters. She stuffed her ears with cotton. Not to worry, they yelled at her. The bullets are fake, keep shooting. I was scared to death, my mother says dramatically or perhaps conspiratorially and laughs. She was 22. My father played an interpreter, a POW, a Viet Cong gunning, a car across the bridge. He had skills. He could speak a little English. He had firsthand experience as an actual prisoner of war. He was caught not by the enemy, but by the South Vietnamese army when he attempted to go AWOL to retake his high school exit exam. I was so obsessed with building an airplane that I never bothered to study, he'd tell me, be amused. I have a photo of him standing next to a plane he assembled that never took off. So that's a photo of my dad. The next poem I'm going to read, um, actually is um, part of the story. So it's the understory. In trying to retell my parents' stories, um, it, there's also the fact that in my family, um, my father and I had a falling out and he basically disowned me. It wasn't like the first time. It's really comforting, all the, by the way, to be amongst other Vietnamese people who've been disowned by the parents, which are voluminous, uh, I have to say. Uh, so I, I just think, you know, part of the imagination, so the title of the poem is called Becoming Ghost, and it's thinking about what happens when you, when I and my father had no longer been talking, and yet what had happened in my imagination of who my father had become, or what he imagines me to be as I go on through the world. So what's who am I? Who, who, who are we to each other? So that's something that I was thinking about when I wrote this poem. Becoming Ghost. I stand, by, I stand behind a one-way mirror. My father sits in a room interrogating himself, bright bulbs shining like the idea of a daughter. It looked just like the real thing, the helicopters, the fields, the smoke which rose in colors, the bullets blank but too real. Coppola yelled action, and we dragged slowly across the back of the screen, miniature prisoners of war to Robert Duvall's broad naked chest. What you'll never see written into the credits are our names. Ghost of a daughter, Specta specter, spectator from a future we can only dream of. We'd never dreamt that one day you'd be my age and too bitter to talk to me. I who gave every peso to your mother, who sewed coins into the linings of my pockets so that you could eat enough food and grow taller than either one of us. I'm asking you to look me in the face and say, Father, I'm asking you to see me. Morning yawns and today my father has deleted a daughter. Today, he's blessed with two sons who take after his fire and quicksilver. 
Today he may be haunted by the grip of a friend who died in his arms, but not the scent of a baby girl he held years ago. Women, he says, and spits out a phlegm colored ghost. There is plasm, he says, and shrugs. And then there is ectoplasm. What is a father who has two sons? Happy, he says, with a toothpick pressed between his thumb and forefinger. Happy, he says, looking into the mirror and seeing no reflection. The next poem is based on the same scene. Um, so my parents were hired specifically for the napalm scene um, of the film. And so in trying to reclaim my parents' voices in this, um, I was using the golden shovel form, which was invented by Terrence Hayes. And the golden shovel form is basically, um, so originally comes from um, Terrence Hayes interacting with um, Gwendolyn Brooks's poems and using um, a word from each uh, line at the end of each poem. And this is something that I was, you know, I'd been reading um, the script of Apocalypse Now. There are, there are several versions. And so in this version, it's written and uh, Napalm Sun, nothing else in the world smells like that. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. And so those are the end words for each um, in the poem. And uh, the attempt is, I think, to instead of like pay homage, it is to marginalize his words to the side and center my mother's voice. So this comes from an interview with my mother. I love the smell of napalm, a golden shovel. Did I see napalm explode? all the time. Napalm flames their greasy fingers in the air. I wasn't a son drafted into the war, just a daughter to marry off. After Americans arrived, nothing was left of my grandfather's home. What else do you expect when the tanks roll in? Translate the word. Na, palm, oh yes, the bombed world. Today, I enter my garden teeming with smells, basil and lemongrass. Dragon fruit climbing over the trellis, reptile-like, waxy and succulent. Guava that swell under my watch. Once, a South Vietnamese soldier, I knew him around the village, stumbled into our home. War takes everything we love. He was shot by the Viet Cong. I watched the man bleed out into the sheets. It was the fresh smell of death that got me. Flash forward scene of myself on a film set. I was the Viet Cong. I was the scenery. Napalm explodes up. I heard boom, boom, boom shaking in my fists. Couldn't sleep last night. Who could sleep through a strafing? The sounds echoing boom, boom, boom from that day into this morning. And here's my final poem. So um, this poem is, uh, I, I was watching a lot of The Walking Dead while also working on this project and I came to the realization. So those who don't know what The Walking Dead, it's, a, it's, a, it's still going on. It's a series about the zombie apocalypse um, and survivors trying to move around to find safety. And while watching that, I, I think I, something clicked in my mind, a connection that um, my parents escaping an unsafe place for them was a kind of escape, you know, there was a kind of feeling that there was an analogy there where you're being chased by something um, very unsafe. Um, people who you thought you knew become something else entirely. Um, and so um, I've been using that construction to think of, speculate a little bit, what would it be like to make a film that is um, my family's version of these events? Um, what, what does it mean to make art um, about this story? Um, and would it be right, you know, for what is it even right for me to do so? So it's, it's a larger question. Zombie Apocalypse Now, The Making of. Q soundtrack. The undead include my grandmother, my older sister, 
my uncle, who was a priest, four cousins, still children. They eat the pomelos we set at the altar, all in a circle, peeling the membranes, dropping the segments into each other's mouths. I am the director. The zombies don't look like zombies, just my grandmother unable to speak, the flies reanimating her bodies giving up, just my older sister, a little VC sacrificed to show the depravity of war. I yell cut and they ascend into heaven. Makeup, I shout across the set. I ask the artist to bruise the undead. I provide a mood board, sketches composed by my brother, happy to draw again. That's a family production. My father fiddles with the super eight. He shakes his head at the last reel, too dark. My mother, in costume design, head down at the machine, a measuring tape hanging from the curtain. She is burning incense, pouring holy water into the iron. She stitches the tatters and hand hems the silk. She is careful, but we are running low on time. The light is starting to dim. I call down my uncle, my cousins, their faces at the side of the road, the red tableau. I tell them, here is the script. Act natural. This is just like the story of your lives. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for that, Kathy. Really, really powerful and moving work. And, and thank you so much for, for showing those images and, and to even showcase the, the written work on the, on the screen was, was quite nice. Thank you for that. Um, up next, we have Miter Vang who is the author of Yellow Rain, Grey Wolf Press 2021, and Afterland, Grey Wolf Press 2017, winner of the 2016 Walt Whitman Award of the Academy of American Poets, long listed for the 2017 National Book Award in Poetry, and a finalist for the 2018 Kate Tufts Discovery Award, the recipient of a Lannan Literary Fellowship. She served as a visiting writer at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, she teaches in the MFA program in creative writing at Fresno State. Please give it up for Miter Vang. Great. Hi, everyone. I hope that you're well this evening. Um, thanks for being here. Um, and it's great to see um, all these familiar names in the chat and to be here alongside my fellow readers. Um, thanks to Muriel and to Neela at Kaya Press and to Quentin, Jimmy, and Yvonne at Beyond Baroque for gathering us here this evening. Thanks also to my fellow readers, Kathy Lin Che and Kathy Shang, whose readings were just stunning and, and really blew me away. Um, thanks also, and especially to the inspirational Trong Tran for writing this necessary and beautiful and groundbreaking work of disruption and truth. Um, congratulations on the publication of Book of the Other, Small in Comparison. And I really look forward to hearing you read this evening. So I will be reading from my new book of poems, uh, Yellow Rain. And this is a collection that examines and tries to reckon with and attempts to reinvestigate the fallout um, surrounding allegations of a chemical biological weapon that was used against Hmong refugees following the US withdrawal from its wars in Vietnam and Laos. And my work in assembling this collection involved years of research into declassified documents, government reports, and other archival material, um, really in an effort to try and offer a counter narrative um, and at the very least try to, you know, to offer another version of the events that. Um, in my mind, hopes to serve as a resistance to the narrative that was being told by the white scientists and the partisan politicians who, um, who sought to invalidate and discredit the Hmong people, or who, on the other hand, sought to leverage and exploit the Hmong suffering to fulfill their own political agendas. And so the book tries to take the reader through that very complicated journey of, um, of Yellow Rain. Um, so the first poem I'd like to read for all of you is near the beginning of the book and it's called, They Think Our Killed Ones Cannot Speak to Us. As if to adjourn all oxygen from the neck 
is how they try to take the voice. As if attempts to render us pale, ripped lungless from woke into wild ash. As if ashes cannot blink, howl, testify with the pulse of their own tatters. As if him and whistle, hail and pour. We've seen how they shame the light, stripped hollow, tearing out filigrees of stars from protocols of dust to make drink a bouquet of venom sprayed down a constellation's throat. They must be so earless as if we no legs to kneel. We are each other's memory of the future 40 years from here, arriving at ourselves by way of the dead. History will not beget powder, will not beget myth, will not make us into marginalia. As ever possessed by what we have lost, there are no language barriers in the afterlife. A toxin is a toxin is a toxin is the man-made truth, is the dead who leave everything behind. So um, one of the uh, most significant features and components of the entire Yellow Rain investigation when it was happening in the late 70s, early 80s was this uh, investigation that the United States government conducted. And it was very confusing. It was um, very chaotic. It, it, it just, there was so many bureaucratic loopholes they had to go through in order to get samples shipped across the world. And when I, when I mean samples, they were basically collecting blood samples, uh, vegetation samples, clothing samples from Hmong refugees um, to ship all over the world for testing. Um, and the really heartbreaking thing is that when these samples arrived to laboratories, they had already degraded um, and it was nearly futile to, to really even find out what had actually happened. And so this next poem explores um, the chaos of that whole process of testing these samples. Authorization to, dep to depart ravaged homeland as biomedical sample. Blew you afar, piecemealed bits of spleen, liver, tissues of the second gut orphaned by the whole. Routed you in a vacutainer, Bangkok, Frankfurt deler delayed, Bella's Fort Dietrich, as if only born to serve in post-mortem. Detain offerings of cerebral shards to be juried under a lens, blew you from the silken wilderness of your viscera, from all the vacated leftovers of yourself, sinews snipped cold from the ribs. In this mission of guilt for your unleaving, you've trekked far from the village, salvaged insides from you and other hundreds, sealed on letterhead, dispersed to the globe. Here at long last in these United States, you did not land a body. Only as a vial of blood where you registered as urine did they label you asylum. Sample M3582, victim seven en route to London. Fluids of you granted fare to enter refugee airspace while ending away in a hospital camp stayed behind the sourced you and every else part. Sample M2582, victim nine, no weekend courier, ambiguously arriving. So stomach of laments, how could they not get you here somehow? Only drops relayed lab to lab to lab. Cargo of you quaking inside an ice chest. So, um, I have two more poems I want to share. Um, this next poem is called Subterfuge. Maybe you spiked the dirt with your snare of shivers. You watched lemongrass retreat into the parasols. Discarded this jungle into the cinema of forgetting. You've been lying again. Maybe you knew the venom had been painted, that it slipped beneath torn umbrellas, smothering all touch as a vapor buffet. Honestly, a curse as this is a tribunal for the late uncles, the bemoaned first sons. How you must have felt embassy-like, 
diminishing a species of servicemen for an administration of wasps. And the last poem I want to share with all of you is a poem um, that uh, is, is, uh, is part of a series that appears at the end of the book and um, well, at least close to the end of the book. And I'm going to only read the, the last part of this four part um, piece. Um, and, and to me, it's sort of my attempt to, um, to, to reckon, or maybe even it's a refusal to reckon with the fact that, um, that yellow rain will, will be part of this dark history um, within, within, um, within, within the whole sort of um, history of that war. Um, and um, so this poem is called Manifesto of a Drum, and this is the fourth part in that poem. For as long as a saula can flee, I have been brooding in my sleep, moving through a century of leaves. A voice out of scrying, a river shifting my ears, some early mornings are left for listening to water tones lilting the banks above primeval lake, but the bank has been laffered into the stars, mirroring its clotted hand down to mine. What does it take to raise an answer from the grave? Quantify stillness of doubt through unmarked bodies becoming ciphers for loss. I gather sharpness of my burn beyond agony for an answer. It is not to know the shape of what happened, but to know it happened, it happened, it happened. Here I make my light to gaze the trail, then sing this rain threadbare into storm. If love is the sacrament of digging, then here I hold my found into fire. Thank you all so very much. Thank you so much for that, Miter. Fantastic, fantastic writing from all of you. Thank you for that. Um, up next, and uh, certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Trong Tran, who was born in Saigon, Vietnam in 1969. He is the author of six previous collections of poetry, the Book of Perceptions, Placing the Accents, Dust and Conscience, Within the Margins, and Four Letter Words, and 100 Words co-authored with Damon Potter. He also co-authored the children's book, Going Home, Coming Home, and an artist monograph. I meant to say, please pass the sugar. He is the recipient of the Poetry Center Prize, the Fund for Poetry Grant, the California Arts Council Grant, and numerous San Francisco Arts Commission grants. Um, and lastly, again, congratulations uh, to, to Trang Tran for Book of the Other, Small in Comparison. Uh, we'll have links in the chat for uh, folks to support our writers tonight. Thank you, Chong. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me tonight, Beyond Baroque. I was able to check off one of my bucket list items. I, I used to work with poets and writers, and I always had this uh, desire to one day read with Beyond Baroque. So thank you for that for this opportunity. Um, thank you to Muriel and Mila for, for kind of guiding me along this entire process. It's been incredibly uh, amazing, really has, um, just being able to, to process my thinking through this process has been tremendous. And lastly, to the three readers who just read Wow, wow, and wow. Um, that's some amazing work, folks. Um, and I'm grateful to be in your uh, sharing space with you tonight. Uh, and thank you for doing this for me. Um, I'm going to now just read. Uh, I'm reading for Book of the Other. Uh, I've been reading from this book for the last week. This is now my sixth reading in seven days. And every time I've read from this book this during this time I've started with this poem and it occurred to me that I start with this poem as a way of putting something down or at least attempting to put some something down so this is from book of the other 
In the course of this book, the word motherfucker is used deliberately in excess. The word is used and someone laughed. The word is used in a sentence out of anger. The word is used as violence. The word is used and someone is offended. The word is used in context. My mother, if she knew, if translated, I think my mother would approve. The word interrupts. The word I'm told is just the word she calls every day at 8 a.m. My mother insists on interrupting my sleep. A Vietnamese man died this week, stabbed in the heart. My mother calls to tell me this. The word is used because I do not have another written again into this book. This need to wake, my mother calls to know that I'm alive, this man who died. I wonder if his mother is still awake. Another Vietnamese man is killed in the same week. My mother calls with news of his death. She calls to wake, she won't stop watching. Eight in the morning and my mother calls with details of how a Vietnamese man was killed and dismembered. The word is used even though, even now, my mother tells me the man they killed was about my age. He was 55 years old. My mother forgets how old I am. My mother tells me the boys who killed him are white, the age of my students. In the course of this book, I am thinking about the word and its use. I am attempting to temper the word. This word I know is not just the word. I think about my mother all the time. Of the 8 a.m. wakes, she is fated to hold again and again. For the mothers of those who have been hurt and killed, the mothers of those who hurt and kill, the word, my mother, this mother of a word. You're on the internet. Your mother calls. You write a posting that was not meant for you. You read a posting that is not meant for you. Another man is shot and killed. You click the image. You see it happening. Your anger, this asking. Hi, Facebook friends. Does anybody know any good writing about anger and outrage? Already got Spinoza and Kendrick Lamar. I'm mad but I ain't stressed. Thanks, you crazy lovable motherfuckers. The memory of your friend, that time over dinner with your students when she whispered, those motherfuckers. Motherfucker, this word when said in just the right intonation by just the right person in a home over dinner said with all seriousness and intent said in support received this word of utmost care, comfort to the person who needs it. I see you, it says, I'm with you. A communion, the same word when written in a post, a carefree gesture, consciously careless. That a person was shot and killed again that an unarmed black man running the other way is seen as dangerous, become, becomes endangered, endangered. That I read his words, I saw the recording, I hear her voice, those motherfuckers. This cannot be written as question, as joke, as poem. This is a marking, a memory, an anger to the asking an answer. Ah, okay. A series of questions addressed to you, first and fo foremost. Would you say we are friends? If you were walking down the street and saw that I was fighting with not one, but two rather large individuals, a man and a woman, it was not a fair fight. I was getting my ass kicked. In case you're wondering, they're, they are indeed white. Let me remind you that in this inquiry, 
I've made the assumption that you are a friend or a colleague or perhaps even both. Would you stop to intervene? If you saw from an arm's length that one guy had a knife, I was about to be stabbed from behind. Would you shield me from that blade? Would you clutch it with your bare hands? Would you inform the authorities? Would you scream or shout so that our world could see what was happening? Would you stand next to me? Would you hold my hand? Would you be my witness? Would you testify in court? Would you say he is innocent? Just to be clear, would you say that I'm innocent? Could you bear to look? Are you willing to see? Before you answer, let me be as clear as can be. This is not a poem. There is no room for the abstract. If you were walking down the hallway attached to a room from where you once sat as a peer or as a student, perhaps at one point we shared an office along this hallway. If you saw me fighting for my livelihood, my life, would you stand next to me? A series of questions to you whom I still, I am still calling colleague, if not friend. Where are you? Is it worth it? Why won't you look? Is this worth the price of not seeing, of not wanting to see? Is this worth the price of not saying? Ah. You resist the performance of otherness when writing this book. You insist on saying to your reader that this is not outrage, the performance of anger, but rather anger, the clenching of your fist. This need to write these bricks made of words. You could break a window or two, try hurling it through the imagined obligatory glass ceiling. You keep, you keep trying, but you lack the strength you succeed in only breaking a sweat, break your own skin, breaking and entering. You have been doing this your whole life as writer, as artist, as teacher in the classroom. Still, the re reader still wants to read this as performance. You write inside this book, why do you still want? Ask this of me. In the audience, someone cues a familiar music reminiscent of 80s porn. Your body begins to move involuntarily and still you refuse to perform this dance. You refuse to perform your brokenness. You have been broken, are, are breaking still. You choose to break the sentence. You break the line, you break the language you borrowed perhaps and still you refuse to give it back. I'm gonna end with a poem. Uh, and it's a poem about the dangers of writing a book like this for me, or at least how I perceive it to be the dangers. Um, I'm hoarding language, the English language. For a time when this English language will be revoked reclaimed for when I will be told that writing as I have is deemed a crime. To write the truth is to run the hallway in search of an exit. Even so, even when they want you to leave, they wait by the exit to catch you for leaving. Thank you, folks. Oh my God, Chao Trang, thank you so much for that. Please, everyone, give it up. Give it up for, uh, for Chao Trang and Miter Vang and Kathy Shang and Kathy Lynch. Uh, uh, um, if we can actually have all the, um, the writers for tonight maybe um, show their video, there we all are. Uh, thank you so much for that. That was amazing, amazing. Thank you, thank you. Um, before we leave tonight, we do have some space um, to have a few, a, a bit of a Q&A, um, and, I, and I do know that um, there was already a question 
um, in the chat uh, for Kathy Lynn Che. Um, I'm not sure if you want to maybe vocalize that or speak a little bit more on that, but if you do have a question, feel free to um, type it in the chat and um, show your love in the chat as well for these wonderful, wonderful, wonderful readers. Thank you. I mean, uh, I'll answer the question real quick. The, the question was just about, is my, uh, um, is the prose, this is a, I mean, this is a larger question, I guess, um, is the prose titled Fade In the same as a poem that is floating around the internet um, in the Brooklyn Rail called Fade In? And I use titles over and over again in some part because titles are very difficult for me. So um, when I have one, I'll just reuse it. But I also really love the imprint of exploring or, or moving through different um, iterations of the same, sort of exploring the concept over and over and over again. So that does appeal to me. And I, 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 you know, I also like working in different genres because I think they offer different possibilities. So, um, you know, I know everybody here is working in many different modes. Um, so, you know, working with visuals unlocks something that is different for me than working in poetry in particular, because the specific form can unlock something new. Um, working in prose, sometimes that means I can maybe fill in the gaps that poetry uh, might offer, you know, in a useful way. Um, but yeah, that's, that was um, my answer to that. I, I have questions for folks because Trung, oh my God, that poem was so, those poems are so fire, like fire. And you said, oh, when you read the last piece, you said, I'm going to read a poem. So do you, are, were the other two pieces also poems or were they of a different genre? I say po poem out of habit, to be honest, because mm -hmm. um, I trained as a poet. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of in my in my blood, but I I'm not entirely trusting of poetry at this stage in my life. Um, I I call the work anti poems um, because for much of this book I was trying to avoid or resist the idea of a metaphor. Mm. Although I also have said that I'm addicted to metaphors. It's an addiction, and I I fall back on it but I, I was trying very hard to resist the metaphor in this book because I, I didn't want to create a, a shelter for, for the reader to hide in. So that shelter becomes a luxury in the book. Mm. I want to avoid that. So are they poems? I don't know. They're fragments. I like to think they're essays at times, but, but um, it's yet to be seen how people will receive that work. Um, thank you for that. That's wonderful because uh, y'all should get this book. It is, how, how many pages is it, did you say? 240 pages. It's a long book. I have a lot to say. <laughs> 240 pages and I don't know, I'll, I'll just stop talking soon, but I, I, I am extremely inspired by um, the fact that your poetry book is novel length you know the, these ideas of genre it's very liberating to me and Miter's book is also 150 pages of poetry or no 220 pages of poetry with notes and that also feels very liberating and I was just thinking you know another liberation that I was and I'll stop I swear but Kathy was talking before about during this time of the pandemic just you know unplugging from social media altogether. And there was something so um, utterly tender about um, your work, Kathy. And it, feel, it felt like a you know, deeply engaged personally in, in a way of um, coming. It, that work seems born of a, a, a place of contemplation that really feels also I know it's a lot of grief, but liberatory. So thank you so much.
any other uh, questions for, for our group here tonight? Um, Um, so there's a there's a question from Muriel in the chat. Um, since you've all read poems about deep grief and rage, what do you think is the relationship between those two emotional uh, valences? Thanks for that, Muriel. Does anybody want to start? I was like, Trung, did you want to go? I I see you're unmuted. Um, was just. I'm bad with technology, my apologies for that. Um, I guess I will, uh, I'll start then. Um, I'm trying to write into the consideration of rage as a craft. Um, and I'm trying to do that because, you know, if, if white poetics could write in a way that feels exclusionary, whether it be through the, the consideration of experimental forms or, or language poetry, then we as, we as writers of color kind of live with this consideration of rage often. And so wanting to write and, and hold that rage as a practice of craft is something that I've been trying very hard to, to facilitate for myself. Um, that's all. I don't want it to, to seem out of control because it's not, it's a craft to me. It's something that I'm, I'm trying very hard to hone. I love that idea of rage as craft because I absolutely agree. You know, I think that I think that sometimes we don't allow ourselves to experience that anger or to express it even. And and um, and I think for me um, with Yellow Rain, I was I felt I felt really angry when I wrote a lot of those poems, and I just it didn't it to me it was like it had to be felt, you know, I, it, it was, it was, I, I just had gotten to a point where I was fed up of just trying to sort of, you know, have closure with it, you know, sometimes closure can be um, such a Western concept of how to, how to get over something. And for me, it was just, it was okay to, 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 to stand in the moment of the rage um, so that that could be you know, experienced and, and, um, you know, find its way into those poems. So yeah, I, I, I think we have to allow ourselves to be, to be angry, to, to sort of stand up and to, um, and to speak what needs to be said. And I think, Chong, you're, you know, you've just been, and this new work that you're, that you've offered us, this gift of this book is an extraordinary example of that courage um, to be able to, to think of craft as rage. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you. Something, um, my dear, that you mentioned um, in thinking and talking about closure and needing to feel the poems. Um, it, I've been writing grief poems for a very long time and seemingly, I, it's curious because it is, writing is such a performative gesture, um, speaking and reading it out loud and, and also in remembering, memory is also performative and informative. Um, closure is something that I, I don't think I've ever really understood uh, the concept um, besides shutting up the, the emotions or the pains associated. So for me personally speaking anyway, in my in my writing journey and, and trying to explore my complicated grief and not being able to actually give space to to the ones who have passed and um, my brother died and then and then my uncle and then my mom and um and, and making space for them has been very tricky um and I'm, I'm just trying to think that most people for some uh, grief poems have been around forever and yet it feels like a, a conversation few want to enter because how vulnerable it makes you and and how vulnerable it makes readers um i'm trying to get to a, a point here in that i guess i write my grief poems 
And because it's a challenge for me to confront it in my own personal life, but to try to see it on the page, what does it look like? And how, how, can, how can I keep, I, I have to live with it for the rest of my life. So how then will it look every time I come to the page? And I, I want to honor that because my parents and growing up in a refugee household, um, grief was the very first thing I learned and, and embraced. So just wanted to honor and hold everyone tonight and just thinking about Kathy's poems and images and my, their, um, that collection, my heart is not ready. <laughs> my heart is not ready um, and strong. It's just, it's been amazing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Kathy. I was just thinking about this idea of, you know, in the chat, people are talking about eloquent rage and there is some, you know, I think, you know, I, I wrote a line to myself in my diaristic writing about this idea of rage feeling like an in, inelegant emotion. Um, but I don't know what that means, you know, and so part of me wonders about, you know, grief is something I know how to access, but rage is something I certainly have access to, but it does feel um, often when we think about it, it's um, both grief and rage, I think are uh, unacceptable, unacceptable socially. There are sort of, you know, it, there, there are spaces where people get really uncomfortable if you, bring up your rage, if you bring up your grief, there's um, something about that that I am attuned to, but I'm also attuned to how, how free I felt hearing all of your work. So I think that's something that I'm thinking about as well. If I could also add the weight that we put on the consideration of grief and weight and, and rage, then makes makes the the expression of grief and rage and 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 quite honestly the expression of truth becomes this this act of exceptionalism and bravery and i think of that too as, a, as like what does it mean to be brave but imagine a, a world if we didn't have to think about that as brave imagine a world if we could express ourselves and speak the truth like breathing like laughing, right? It takes away the culture of fear and silence that that holds everything in place, right? And and that that is the struggle that I've had, which is, you know, how you break from that silence, how do you break from that free, and do something as simple as telling the truth. And that's that's the attempt of the work, and I hear that tonight in all of you as well. Yeah, I wanted to, when you said um, as easy as laughing, I actually think what's really interesting to me is that I definitely heard humor, Trung, in your work. And I've always thought, you know, Vietnamese people are really funny. Like my family is very funny, but oftentimes my work is dead serious. Like that humor never finds its way in. And so I want to also you know, as an emotional valence, recognize, you know, because there's so much urgency around expressing the grief or this, or expressing what hasn't been said, sometimes I have elided, you know, the humor in, 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 the, in my family's life as well. So that's another kind of vector of emotion that I think about um, that I'd like to work, work on writing into it some more you know what they say a funeral is never complete until you break out into laughter <laughs> true <laughs> it's true it's very true thank you so much for that wonderful discussion folks um we, we do have one question maybe we can uh close it off uh with one more question uh perhaps so elise in the chat asks um a, a question regarding composition and form but you know, as an aspiring poet myself, how does one go about thinking more lyrically when writing poetry and refining it? 
Is it a matter of practice or something more? And, and similar to this idea of taking grief or rage and, and constructing it as craft, um, how can aspiring poets uh, kind of tune into those emotions and, and craft the, uh, those emotions to writing? I have thoughts, but does that, somebody else want to go? I do too, but I, I like you, Kathy, I want to sit back on this one first. Yeah. I'd love to hear someone else too, but <laughs> but I'll just chime in quickly. I mean, I feel like um, I feel like it's something that uh, for me as a poet, I'm still continually continually learning how to do um, and and to continue to refine. Um, you know, and I, I don't know that um, I don't know that you know that we ever really know if we've done it well or if we've written something that um, that is 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 sort of the polished thing that we want it to be, um, or we think that we have the potential to make it to be. Um, and so for me, I think it's a continual um, chipping away at. Um, so I guess the, the quick and easy answer is, um, is that it's, it's, a, it's, it's a matter of just continuing to do it. It's a matter of continuing to return to the page. Um, and, and for me, it's also a matter of like paying attention to the world around you, to listening to the sounds, the sonics, the musicality of your life, um, of your environment, of the people you live with, and uh, just everything in your external environment, because these things have a way of creating its own language in your own poems, whether you realize it or not. One thing I, I often t talk about is the fact that growing up as a um, Growing up in a Hmong family, you know, and hearing the Hmong language, I was heavily influenced by the the tonal structures of of the language, and so I find myself writing in ways where um, I'm deeply invested in the sound of the words because I'm also kind of mimicking the the sounds I heard as a child, and so again, it's just you know paying attention to your external environment and and using that to help inform. Um, you know, um, and to continue to refine um, you, where you might go um, and, and just being open to what, what's out there. Try something that you um, might never try. Uh, it's one thing I always tell my uh, workshop students is, um, you know, try something that makes you a little scared to try. Um, and, and sometimes you'll surprise yourself, right? That's the, that's the, that's the hope is to surprise yourself. Um, so yeah, others here want to chime in? If I could add to that, I would say, listen to your voice. I mean, really listen to it. Because I believe that poetry is uh, an oral art form. And and I'm, I'm actually reading thesis right now and I'm reading some um, prose thesis. And one thing that, that I, I'm realizing as I read it is that the prose writers aren't listening in some ways to their own voice. They write beautifully, but it's not to be heard. And as, as poets, we write to be heard as well. So listen to your voice. I mean, I will just say, I agree. I think early on when I was an emerging writer, I think my idea of poetry was, you know, is this, you know, I would write something, is this poetry? Is this not poetry? Is this beautiful enough? Is this interesting enough? And that doubt was not um, serving me. So I think, you know, I moved into a, a space of automatic writing. And what that is, is actually just listening to your voice and slowly transcribing it and see what emerges from there. Um, I think that practice um, gave me a lot of sense of trust in my own um, writing uh, that you know what what will come you have to have faith that your voice is valuable so I think and not valuable in the mind of somebody else making judgments on it but sort of you have to also trust um, when you read it does it you know in an easy way not in an overly critical way but does this do something for me does this satisfy me so I think that's where I come from
Well, I, I think we'll we'll cap it there. Thank you so much again, Trong, Miter, Kathy, Kathy, um, all the folks who are still with us here tonight, um, engaging in conversation. Um, again, a big thank you to Muriel and Mila over at Kaya Press for allowing us to, to share virtual space. Uh, this was fantastic. Um, and yeah, hope everyone has a good night. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.